హలలుయా హలలుయా సింగ్ they shall not be afraid let them not be afraid even as we draw them closer as we bring them in let them not be afraid we are walking down a corridor that is lined up with angels on either side and many of us our natural tendencies will be to tremble as we approach this great corridor of power And the Lord says let them not be afraid as we pull them in. The Lord is drawing us closer to himself. The Lord is pulling his saints in. And all of these many things that terrify and all of these ma- many things that scare the average mind and the average set of emotions will not keep us away from drawing closer. The Lord is the one that's come for us. He's the one pulling us in. And so let your heart not be afraid. The Lord is saying, let them have no fear as we are drawing them closer and pulling them in. He's pulling us back in. That's what he's doing so that he can bring us out again, glorified, transfigured, transmogrified, ready to wow the rest of creation with the goodness of God for he is highly lifted highly lifted up he says if i be lifted up i will draw all men to me he is a highly lifted highly lifted up he is lifted high and he is drawing us to himself don't let any weight hold you back don't let any burdens take out the pleasure of this experience from your heart let him pull you in let him lift you up father we give you praise thank you lord jesus oh lord we worship you as you draw in us in we worship you lord as you draw in us in we trust in as you drawing us in we will have no fear we trust in you we trust in you we trust in you as you're pulling us in we trust in you oh we trust in you father we lose every fear We are confident because your process is a loving process and it is it was designed with us in mind and it is being executed with us in mind. Father we thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's be seated. Praise God. God bless you guys. That was awesome. That was amazing. Praise the Lord. Excellent. God is good. All righty. Oh man, God is good. So whoever was helping us with the lights earlier you can you can resume your lighting right now. That looks like it. 
Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Ah, Let's quickly look at the book of Philemon. Father, we worship you because great is your faithfulness, O Lord. And I'm just going to read verse 3 of that book of Philemon of Philemon. For those of you who may never have heard that before, it's in your Bible. So Krukukundi Yagimos Komandaya Lamande Brikidus Kyul of Labi. And it's very um it's actually quite easy, you know, sometimes to overlook the man uh by that name. Philemon. But we need to um, learn one or two things from him today. So um, let's read the first three verses and then we're going to hone in on verse three. Um, the Bible says, and this was a letter that Paul had written to one man. He wrote Timothy letters, but they were essentially guidance or what you would call um, mentoring points for how to pastor a church because Timothy was a young man who was a pastor of a local church and Paul was his mentor. And so there were things that were said to him and that is the reason why when you look at it, he gave him the confidence with which to stand on the word of God. Because when you look at what things Paul wrote to Timothy, he would continually tell him about the efficacy of scriptures. He ensured that he gave that young man confidence in the word of God so that the elders and the religious people that wanted to bash him around or push him around can fail at it. Because he said to Timothy, he says, let no one despise your youth. He said to him also to pay attention to the word of God, to recognize that every scripture was given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And when certain people came and wouldn't want to accept the sonship of Jesus, his humanity was too much for some people to handle. Paul also wrote to Timothy, he said to him, great is the mystery of godliness. Tell those religious people that it is okay for them not to get it. Tell them it is a mystery, not just an ordinary one, but a great mystery indeed. This was one of the other guys who worked alongside with them by the name of Philemon. And um, verse 1 says, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our, bro our beloved friend and fellow laborer. I want us to pay attention to something going on in here because in the order of appearance, they are telling us about who we should be in Christ Jesus. You remember Saul or Paul used to be named Saul. And what does Saul mean? Saul means one that is desired. You know, the one that everybody wanted to be like, a desirable one. And when he was Saul, Everybody wanted to be like him because he was a very successful lawyer. He knew the law. He had the equivalent of a PhD at law. He graduated from the equivalent of Harvard Law School because he was a direct student of Gamaliel, which was an uncommon privilege at the time. In fact, that the fact that he was a student of Gamaliel meant that he was paid to speak at lectures. And everybody wanted to be like Saul because Saul became so prosperous he could afford to buy himself Roman citizenship. Imagine how wealthy you have to be as a Jewish man who was prominent in the Jewish nation to have obtained at the same time Roman citizenship. You know why? Because the Romans did not want to give out their citizenship just like that. As, at the same time, the Jews saw you as a sellout to obtain Roman citizenship. So for 
Saul to have obtained dual citizenship while not being rejected by his mates meant that they respected him. Some of them feared him because he was quite a fierce man. Whatever he wanted done, got done. Remember when he was persecuting Christians? He saw to it that the first Christian was murdered because he was preaching the gospel. So the first, the first matter that we read about in scripture is the man by the name of Stephen. The irony of that. Have you thought about it? The very first man that was killed for preaching the gospel, his name means the crown. Come on. You wouldn't have expected that, would you? Because what people thought was that this Jesus has gone to be with the Father. Now we can expect a crown of glory because the order had been set that we will be justified if he would raise or be raised from the dead. And when Jesus was raised from the dead, they were justified. And they knew that after you have been justified, then you have to be glorified. And so the crown of glory was what the natural man would expect. But what did he get? He had his life taken because he awaited a crown. But blessed be the name of the Lord because so that we do not lose sight of that crown, so that our hopes were not completely dashed into, into, into pieces. The Lord Jesus gave us a privilege. He gave us a very, he did us a solid with Stephen. Because imagine if you were a believer at the time, and the one person, because if you remember, Stephen was a young fellow who was fairly educated, and so he could relate with the likes of Saul, and that was the reason why they had, they had their eyes on him because he was not like the other illiterates. The other guys did not really bother Saul. You never heard Saul going after Peter, James, and John. Even though they were prominent, he felt like there was no point trying to reason with a bunch of fishermen who would not last but a couple of weeks. They were going to get hungry and they were going to go back to their boats. But Stephen, on the other hand, was almost an elite. And so he was able to speak and attend the same lectures that Saul was speaking at. And Saul was like, okay, we need to teach this little boy a lesson. Because remember, the people who stoned Stephen to death were not poor people. Because poor people could barely afford a tunic, talkless of having a cloak. And all the men who stoned Stephen were men whose cloaks were too precious to be placed on the ground. When they took it off, they put it over the one who commanded their ranks. The Bible says that was the same Saul who was there, who received the garments of the men who stooped down to pick up the stone of persecution. And by the time it was done in that exercise, the same men signed the petition that gave him the authorization with which he went to the high priest to obtain even a higher authority with which to round up not just the miscreants, quote unquote, amongst the believers, but to round them all up, including the wives of the Romans who had com converted to Christianity. And when he was on that mission, everybody hailed him because he was so passionate about his ambition. He was so zealous for the cause. He was at that time Saul. But when he saw the Lord Jesus, he saw a light that was brighter than the sun. He heard a voice that was powerful enough to have come only to the perception of one man who was in the company of his mates. He knew that there was power that was beyond whatever it was that he had wielded up until that time. Remember when Jesus spoke to Saul, he alone heard Jesus. Even though there were many men with him, he was like, you all heard that? And they were like, heard what? That was when he knew that if there is a voice that can single me out of my mates, then it can do to me more than anybody can save me from. And so this man... He changed his name to Paul. 
He went from Saul to Paul. Paul means the little one. So just imagine going from being that dude that everybody wanted to be like. You see, there are times in our lives wherein we need to recognize the souls that may remain in our hearts. There are certain attributes of our demeanor that are a function of consciousnesses that we harbor within us. Notions of ourselves. Like the Bible says, let no one think of himself more highly than he ought to because of the comments, because of the compliments and the commendations that we have received from men who become so puffed up because they say they want to be like us. Because the Bible says that he, when he was still called Saul, had received a commendation from not just the presbytery, but also from the Sanhedrin. He received the commendation, and that's why he felt confident being called the desirable one. You know, many of us, just because people tell us how patient we are, then we find it okay to get angry when someone tries our patience too much. They're like, everybody knows me that I'm a patient person. I don't get angry easily. Everybody knows. So for me to get angry, you must have tried my patience. That's right. You lie. That is exactly correct. Because, you know, we bank on the commendations of man when it comes to how the sale of our lives or the sales of our lives are set. Because of the fact that people have told you that, oh, for you to have gotten angry, it must have been that lady's fault. Because we know you never get angry. And you'll be like, absolutely. Because they're telling you that when we grow up, we want to be like you. And then when Saul recognized that people wanted to be like him, but himself no longer wanted to be like him. He decided to walk away from his old man. And that was why he said, my old man was crucified with Christ. He wasn't referring to his father. Because I know some people call their father their old man. Because I remember when we were in children's church, somebody once came up one day excited. I'll never forget, his face was radiant. He was glowing with pride that he had a revelation that he knew the father of Paul. He said he was one of the thieves that was crucified with Jesus simply because Paul said, my old man was crucified with Christ. That old man, oh, if, I know, if I knew y'all hadn't heard it, I would have set it up different. Yeah, that's a missed opportunity. I'll wait for six months, then I'll try it again. Oh man, what a missed opportunity. But then Paul recognized that he no longer wanted to be Saul and so he took on the name Paul. Which means I am now a little man because I have encountered the one that is mightier than I. I have encountered the power of God and I am humbled under that grace of God. And Paul decided that for him to not go back to his old ways, he needed to allow himself to become a prisoner of the grace of God. To become a prisoner means to have your liberty taken away. And so he surrendered willingly any form of liberty that could allow for him to walk back into another state of consciousness that made him feel like he was more than he was. He says, I'm just going to abandon myself to the grace of God. So when you look at the progression of the men here, and we're still going to get to verse 3 again. In fact, let's read that verse 3 again, and I'm going to go back and explain further these names. Verse 3 of Philemon. What do y'all call it here? Is it Philemon or Philemon? Whatever I say. So today it shall be Philemon. Thank you, Jesus, because I once said Philemon, and someone called me afterwards and said, you're welcome to America, it's Philemon. And I'm like, well, maybe that's you, but I've never heard anyone else say that. So we're going to run with Philemon today. And um, so it, uh, do, 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 do. we're going to read that verse 1 again. Say that, say that again. Verse 3, yes. Sorry, verse 3. And it's so, it's so easy to miss it because 
He's after Timothy. That you have Titus and Titus. You have Philemon. Look at verse 3. It says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. What I would love to share with us today, using primarily the names of these men, is the secret to engaging the grace of God in such a way that it brings peace to your life in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, it's important for us to have peace in that name. Because some of us only recognize peace when the dust settles and when the storm is no longer raging. That is not necessarily peace. That may be quiet. But peace is the stamina that you experience within regardless of what is happening without. Because the Bible did not say that your peace will be when things have, are in a, in a, in a state of, of decorum or, 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 or calm. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. What the will of God is for our lives is for us to know how to attain peace and joy the moment you call his name. <laughs> because sometimes we call his name and are still frustrated. Sometimes we keep calling his name because, you know, the implication of knowing how to immediately be translated from chaos to peace at the mention of his name is that it gives you immunity to frustration and it stops your tongue from cursing your God. Because, you know, many of us, we call his name first and when it doesn't seem like things are changing, then we degenerate by frustration and lack of faith into name calling. And we started to say things like, oh Lord, do you not care that I perish? And we start to ask, where is your face, oh God? Will you let the enemy or my enemies ridicule me? You see, every one of those statements are statements that are the opposites of the names of God. Because when we begin to think that maybe God by some happenstance, has allowed for himself to forget his beloved, what we are saying that he is no longer the glory and the lifter of your head. Because if he is the glory and the lifter of your head, he will not also be the same one that allows for you to be brought to shame. So we get into such situations because hope deferred, the Bible says, makes the heart sick. So, is there, is there, and there is, a remedy to having our hopes deferred? And that remedy is to know how to find everything that you need in his name. You know why? Because he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so the moment you can tap into that name, whatever it is that you are anticipating, can be accessed immediately in his name. So let's read that verse 3 again, and I'm going to go to those names. The Bible says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to verse 1. Paul says, I, Paul, I'm a prisoner of Christ Jesus, you already know. And Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. When the Lord brought this to my attention, he showed me a man in a man in another man. You see, Paul means the little one. Timothy means to honor God. You cannot honor God whilst you are still demanding honor for yourself. The last thing that Saul did before he met Jesus was he went to obtain documents that would allow for him to be seen as honorable 
amongst the sect of the Jews that had yet to join his campaign. He was seeking to be magnified amongst men so that he, he can then have authority in that magnification with which he will then go and perpetrate his evil agenda, which at the time he thought was good. And you know, the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, the end of which leads to death. And so after he met the Lord Jesus, he recognized that all honor must be given to God. And that was why he called Timothy his son. He says, I begot you in this work of the ministry. Basically, after I had become a little one before the Lord, I am producing honor to God. Do you know the reason why many of us get angry at God? Because we believe that we deserve certain things and God is holding it back from us. And so you don't give glory to God, you actually call him out. You say things like, I've been serving faithfully, I've been tithing, I've been giving. I even went on a mission trip. Someone is already suggesting that we go on a two-month mission trip. Uh, 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 come on. <laughs> come on, come on, come on. Let's encourage them and hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> I won't tell you who that person is so that you can still smile when you see them. But people come before the Lord magnifying themselves. This is what I have done. This is who I am. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus. Now, let me tell you something. You know, the Lord is saying to us that he's closer and closer by the day. And so this is what happens when the Lord is closer and closer. We're excited, right? But because he's also light, he begins to reveal the things that he does not want to embrace when he gets close enough for you to grab him. The Bible says he is coming for an ecclesia that is without blemish. And that is the reason why some of the things that we may have overlooked over time, things that have been baked into our culture, things that have been ingrained in us as a function of survival will now or are now being exposed by the Lord Jesus Christ, not to shame any one of us, but to get us ready for glory. And so because we do this and we don't even know that what we're doing is that we're giving honor to self rather than giving glory to God. We say, but Lord, you know that I have done this. I have gone on the mission stream. I have, so why must this be happening to me of all people? Why not? The best of us, the Bible says that every single one of us who are made of flesh, that flesh is bound to fail. And that there is no righteousness, none that is good except the Father. And so there is nothing that qualifies me for God's blessing that is a function of whatever it is that I myself can bring. Because what is it that anyone can bring to God that was not even God's in the first place? <laughs> you see what I mean? All things are His. Holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come, the Bible says you are worthy to receive all the glory, all the honor, all the power, for you have created all things for your pleasure. They are and were created. He owns everything. A cattle upon a thousand hills. He owns everything. And let me tell you something. When we come to God boasting in whatever attribute that it is that we have concluded qualifies us for God's attention, we are asking for worship. Because you know that's what we do when we go to God and we're genuinely worshiping, worshiping him. We tell him that he, the faithful one, is worthy of all of our trust because he never fails. You see, because when you give him worship, in that, in that manner, then guess what happens? Then we begin to see him in the light of who he really is and we enjoy the benevolence. So when you come before the Lord God and you're magnifying in yourself, guess what happens? You are then exposed for who you really are and all that pride does nothing but disqualify because the Bible says the Lord resists the proud and it does not like the look of the haughty one. You know, sometimes you haven't even said anything, but the look on your face, as soon as you show up in God's presence, God is like, here we go again. What, is, what have we done this time? Or what have we not done this time? 
You see, it is imperative for us to know that it's not just going to happen magically that we are able to genuinely give honor to God if we don't first of all see ourselves as little before the Lord. We are supposed to come before the Lord <laughs> and say, I do not glory, like Paul said, in the abundance of revelations. He says, I know a man, whether in the body or outside of the body, I cannot tell. He said, but of such a one, I do not even boast. He said, he has heard voices. He has heard the conversations of holy angels, even words that must not be uttered. He says, but I still do not glory in such a one. He said, but guess what? I glory in my infirmity. He said, because my infirmity is darkness. And it is through that darkness that the light of the anointing will shine. He said, I glory in my weakness because in my weakness, the strength of God is made perfect. Now, if you were God, who would you receive? That one or the one that says, I gave? Like the rich young ruler, he came to Jesus. And Jesus was like, okay, um, I hear that you're applying for discipleship. He says, uh, to be honest, <laughs> surprise. Surprise, surprise, I am, you know, someone of my caliber, you know, I'm really stooping low to the level of discipleship. That was his posture. And Jesus proved it. And because when he came, you know what he said? He says, good teacher. He's almost like telling Jesus, like, you know, you and I, we can relate because we're the good guys, not all these other ones. And Jesus rebuked him immediately. And Jesus says, there is none that is good. So basically, all that goodness that you think you have in your heart, just drop it quickly. Drop it like it's hot. Because only the Father is good. Thank you. Thank you, baby. Thank you. And Jesus said to him, just cut it off. Only one is good. Can you imagine? Someone comes to you and they start to shower you blessings. I mean, compliments. I don't know about you, but I'll be rubbing that thing in all day. I'll be taking it in, I mean, all day. You know, I like to tell people I am humble and I'm proud of it. You see what I mean? You know, and we are kind of like always, all of us are like that in a way, you know, people give you compliments and you're like, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing. But you want, to, you want them to keep, to keep saying it. Over. Yeah. So it's like, oh, it's nothing, it's nothing. But can I hear it from the people in the back louder, please? And this man came and he was seeking for Jesus to validate his goodness. And Jesus says, there is none that is good. And immediately the guy took it personal. And he was like, oh, but I don't know where you've been, Jesus. Maybe you've been under a rock. But you see that orphanage down the road? I built it. Were you here spring of 94? If you were, you'd remember that that street used to be lined up with beggars and homeless people. <laughs> I housed all of them. Some of them, till they died, they were feeding on my account. That was what he told Jesus. He told Jesus, he says, from my youth, I've been a good guy. I have been feeding the poor. I have not caused my hand to be short from their needs. So why are you now denying me the goodness that is mine? And Jesus knew, I mean, of course, it's Jesus, that you cannot receive from the one that you do not honor. How do we receive from God? The Bible says he is worthy to receive all the glory and honor. When he receives the honor, then we receive the blessings. Right? Because you have to connect with God with something to be able to draw from him. That was why he says, you have to come to me. Whosoever comes to me must first of all believe that I am and that I have got something to give. That I am a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. You understand what I mean? And so Jesus wanted to teach him, first of all, about honor, but you cannot receive a, less, a lesson on honor when you're still pompous and big. And so what did he say? Jesus said, let's start with making you a little smaller than you are. Because his head was like that. And so what did Jesus say? Jesus says, okay. Because you have come to me, I'm not going to cast you away. Because the Bible says, whosoever comes to God, God says, whoever comes to me, I will in no wise cast away. Because if it was me and that guy was that proud, I would have shown him the road. I would ask for his form, his discipleship form. I'd be like, is this your form? 
true. Take the pieces. Get out of here. You're not fit for the kingdom. Because the apostles did that afterwards. So that's why I felt like maybe I could do that too. Oh yeah, because remember when Simon the sorcerer came to the apostles, they cast him out because he was, he was talking nonsense, right? But when this man came to Jesus, even though he was yanning dust, he was saying nonsense. I don't think people use the word yanning dust around here. He was talking, he was talking trash. Jesus just said, we're going to help you because if we don't help you, where are you going to go? I believe that's why God doesn't cast people out because if he casts you out, there's only one other place, the lake of fire for destruction. And so he would do his best possible to accommodate you and your shenanigans. Aren't we thankful that he does that? Because if not for that, where would we be today? And so this man, even though he was talking all of what he was talking, Jesus was like, why don't you go now, sell all of what you have and give to the poor? The man was called a rich young ruler. When you look at rulers in our world today, many of them claim to be philanthropists. But their philanthropy is mostly them giving away things that immediately benefit them. Because the rich young ruler, even though he said he had given to the poor, he had done this and that, he still had enough to be seen as a rich man that commanded the people's respect as a ruler. Sounds familiar? That's what people do today. So you find wealthy people, they will look for people who are seemingly disadvantaged and they will give to them so that they can rule over them. At least if I was the one that gave you the school, you're going to have to use the kind of computer that I recommend. If I make Windows computers and I give you a school, if you put a Mac in there, I will set it ablaze. <laughs> because my gift to you is not a free gift. It's a bait. I want to lock you in. You understand what I mean? At least I didn't call nobody's name, so no one's going to be mad. And if they are still, God bless them. But you see how it works. He was a rich young ruler, and Jesus wanted to make sure that this man understands the principles of giving like God gives, and in that process, emptying out enough to be able to fit into Jesus' discipleship program. Because to be able to draw from Jesus, you have to be able to honor him. And when he's saying things that you don't, you don't even understand, you still honor him anyway. Because when Jesus fed the 4,000 and he told them that they had to eat his flesh and drink his blood, they were like, for a second there, you had us. We thought you were the real deal. But we didn't know you were just a cannibal. Talking about blood sucking. Because what he was saying did not agree with them. His political opinions differed from theirs. His methods were different. And when you don't honor someone and you disagree with them, what you do is you walk away. But when you honor somebody and you disagree with them, if you honor them right, you will say what the disciples said to Jesus. After the 4,000 left Jesus, what did Jesus do to his disciples? He turned and looked at them and he said, so the 4,000 men have left just because of what I said. What about you? Are you going to leave also? In fact, he said to them, aren't you going to leave also? And they were like, uh, we would have loved to. But we have already left all to follow you. Honor can only truly function if it is a non-reversible process. The facet of the grace of God has a non-return valve which is called Sacrifice, emptiness, humility. Because if you haven't humbled yourself and you kept some of your ego, some of your pride, then you have something to fall back on in case this Jesus arrangement did not work. Because those other people, they have something to fall back on. They did not resign from their jobs. They only took a leave of absence to go and watch a show out of town. And as soon as the show was not showing, they were like, oh, see you later. They left, but the disciples said, 
We have nowhere else to go because we have already left all to follow you. And so what happens was, even when their flesh wanted to be dishonoring, they had already made such a commitment that it was impossible for them not to just listen to this man. Now he can tell us whatever. Now we have no choice. We just have to listen. Our lives need to be that honoring of God for us to be able to say or for him to call us friends. You see what I mean? Because afterwards, what did Jesus say to his disciples? He was like, now no longer do I call you servants, but I call you friends. The rich young ruler came and wanted to talk to Jesus as a contemporary. Another good guy, one good guy to the other. But he didn't know that the way up is down. You have to, first of all, empty yourself. And that was what Paul did. Paul, Saul became Paul, giving everything away. Do you know that even the Roman citizenship that he paid for, he did not evoke that citizenship while he was being punished as a commoner, even though he was meant to be a first-class citizen. He only mentioned it in passing. And they were like, why did you let us beat you so much? You could have said that since yesterday. You could have said that since last year. But Paul was like, I, I'm just mentioning it as a testimony because I'm, I'm no longer laying claim to it because I've already counted it as a loss for the sake of that which I have gained, the grace of God. You see, <laughs> if you have the opportunity to show kindness to somebody, maybe you're going somewhere and there's a friend of yours who cannot pay for their flight. And then you're like, don't worry about it. You don't have to drive 16 hours. I'll pay for your flight. Even if it's Spirit Airline, I'll pay. <laughs> if, I mean, you know. Oh, yeah. You see, if you have truly paid and given that completely, then it should never come up the way, it should never come up the day they hurt your feelings. What we do is usually we don't give, we transact. I give you $320 ticket money, 316 before taxes. Because now with that, you can get on American because spirit is probably only $12. Manuel Lira says seven. Is that from experience? <laughs> you see, you take the 316 to buy someone's freedom. Now they can no longer talk to you anyhow. You have taken away the, the liberty of expression simply because you gave them $316 and your heart has not fully re released it. You know how different it is when your heart has fully released it? You buy them the ticket and then you delete it from not just your account but from your mind. So that the day they hurt you, the only thing you would be able to lay claim of is the same free gift that both of you received. So instead of saying, hmm, I should have known better than to buy you a ticket the other day. I should have let your behind drive. I should have. But because you have already given it freely and deleted it completely, so which makes it not a transaction but a gift, the day they hurt you, all you'll be able to lay claim of will be the grace of God. And all you'll be able to say is that, but you know that, the way Jesus died for you was the way he died for me. Why would you treat me like that? Because when you come to someone like that, all you're laying claim of is a common ground that does not elevate you above another. Because in reality, who are we without the grace of God? So the rich young ruler had not really given anything. He had only carried out the transaction that he might be seen as a ruler amongst men. But Jesus says for you to have truly given... You then need to be like the ones that you have given to. You all need to be leveled up. So give everything you have to the poor. Because the moment you give everything you have to the poor, then you have become the poor too. Because now you have nothing. And it is at that time that you can then receive the glorious grace and privilege of the gospel. Because Jesus is blessed at the poor, but they shall see God. So, Going back to the names, if we keep it to the names because we're not on central time, let's just keep it to the names. Saul became little 
that he may become Timothy. That he may be able to truly give glory to God. Because when you have completely given of yourself, when you have completely eliminated ego and pride, when you have come to realize that you are nothing without the grace of God, that if anything at all, you do not have any liberty whatsoever to lay claim of whoever you are or whatever you have done, you can then say that I am a prisoner of the grace of God because the grace was freely given. So I cannot boast in anything. And it is at that time that your life then begins to truly honor God. Because every time somebody wrongs you, there is nothing else for you to lay claim on. You have to turn the other cheek. And that humility gives glory to your heavenly father. Every time you're fighting your own battle, you're taking the place of God. God steps aside for you. He lets you be God in your own life. Just so that you can see the futility of such an ambition. If Satan's life is not enough for you as an example, then be on your own race and do your own thing. Eventually, you will see that that outcome never changes. It is the same for everybody who by pride attempts to take the place of God. So lastly, Paul, Saul became Paul. And as Paul, he professed being a prisoner of the grace of God, which means he deprived himself of whatever it is that he can boast in. You can read that in Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3, he talks about what it truly means not to be able to boast in anything but the grace of God. In Romans chapter 3, in Romans chapter 5, in Romans chapter 8, he talks a lot about not being able to boast in anything but the grace of God. Now, when you come to who came after Timothy, the guy's name is Philemon. And Philemon means the one who kisses. The Bible says, kiss the son and it shall be well with you. This was written to Jewish men who recognize that the highest level of respect that you can show to anybody is not just to say that you honor them with your lips or to take a bow to honor them. Kenyatta, let me come and let me demonstrate to you if you don't mind coming up here. Let me demonstrate to you what this name Philemon, what it really means. You see, when you see somebody that has been exalted by God, when you see someone who is your neighbor, when you see somebody for whom the Lord Jesus died, you know, for Jesus to die for somebody, that means they are somebody. Even if they were nobody, the fact that Jesus died for them, they have become somebody. Because the Bible says that no one takes this honor unto himself. It's, a, it's an honor that we cannot receive except it was given. So when you see a person like that, he is worthy of honor. And so what do you do? You don't think of yourself, what, what is a man? I'm a man, so why do I have to honor him? No, you reduce yourself and become a Paul. And once you have become a Paul, you don't even necessarily look him in the eye. But you're like, wow, well, brother, I just, uh, yeah, just uh, if you need anything, just let me know I'm, I'm here to serve. And you're saying that because you've taken the posture of humility. And then you go on and become a Timothy, which is to give honor to that person by taking a bow in respect and in honor. That is what Timothy means. But Philemon means the one who stoops low to kiss the feet of another. That is you reducing yourself to the ground when it comes to your heart posture in seven other people. Jesus demonstrated it by being the first Philemon of the New Testament. He bowed himself before his disciples and he washed each of their feet. And what they do is after washing the feet of another, you take it close to your face and you kiss it. I'm not going to kiss your feet because you haven't washed your feet. <laughs> but you, you get the point. God bless you. <laughs> you see, but that's what it means to wash the feet of another. It doesn't just mean to wash the feet and then slap it off and say, next. No, it means you're washing it off because you want to place your mouth over it in honor. It is not enough for us to just humble ourselves before the Lord and to honor him with the things that we say. We need to show actions that are honoring to God. And the way by which you kiss his feet is by serving others. Jesus told his disciples, he told Peter. Peter was like, Jesus, you do, the, you do the most sometimes. You know that, right? Because you are the master. You are the teacher. We should wash your 
feet, not you. And Jesus said to him, if you do not let me wash your feet, you do not have a part in me. And that was when it hit Peter. And Peter was like, ah, in that case, wash my entire body. You understand what I mean? Wash my entire body. And what Jesus was telling him was this. This is the way to get into my grace. When you look at the rich young ruler, Jesus said to him, Jesus said to his disciples, after the rich young ruler went away sorrowful, he said, you see how difficult it is for a rich man to come into the kingdom of God. He said, it is as though you are trying to get a camel to go through the eye of the needle. The eye of the needle is a gate that goes into Jerusalem, I think from the West Gate, that was so low that a camel could only get in by offloading everything that it's carrying and then crawling on its knees to go through the eye of the needle. If you've seen a camel go through the eye of the needle, when it comes out on the other side, the first thing you will notice is that its entire mouth is covered in dust because camels, when they're on their knees, by default, their mouth rests on the ground. They begin to fill him on their way through the eye of the needle. And the Lord God Almighty is saying, you want to press into my grace? You want the mention of my name to deliver to you the tower that brings safety and peace? Then you must learn how not, you must learn to not just be humble. You must learn not, not only to just give glory to God, but you must learn how to stay serving other people, laying everything on the ground for as long as it takes until I bring you up again, saying, arise. Now you may see it. Many of us would love a situation wherein we're constantly in the grace of God. Many of us would love it wherein we're constantly at peace. Wouldn't you want to be at peace the day you have zero dollars as much as the day you have a million? Wouldn't you want to be at peace the day you go to bed with a headache as much as you would be the day you go to bed and you, you fell asleep just because we're having such a good time. We should be at peace because peace, righteousness, and joy, they are the key assets of the kingdom. And the Bible says that they are eternal. They're meant to be consistent all the time. But the reason why they're not in most of our lives is because we, have not, we are still souls priding our, ourselves on the things that we think we have more than other people. You know, the first soul that was introduced to us in the Bible was said to be shoulder higher than everybody else. From his shoulder up, he was taller than everybody else. And most of us focus on the things that we have that others do not have. But one of the things that I am learning, that I believe that we all need to learn, is that we actually need to take the measure of whatever it is that we think we have that others do not have and begin to use that as a yardstick for measuring how much more you still need to serve other people. Can you prophesy? And you think you can prophesy more than other people? Well, congratulations to you. But the extent to which your prophecies are accurate in the lives of other people is actually the extent to which you need to serve them more. Because it is not given to you to stand shoulder higher than anybody else. The Bible says, Paul speaking, he says, we are not like the Lord of the, the rulers of the Gentiles who lord over them. He says, we are helpers of your joy. Whatever it is that we have over you is meant to be turned in inverse to come under you to lift you up. In the service of others is where we find peace that is beyond understanding. It is in the service of others by learning how to kiss the feet of other people. I'm not talking about you becoming a psychophant, keep kissing people's behinds. Everything they say is fine. Oh, they can never do no wrong. No, I'm talking about genuinely looking for ways to get dirt off of other people looking for ways to refresh other people, looking for ways to ensure that that other person knows that to you, they mean the world. Anyone who bends down to wash your feet and to kiss it is telling you that you mean everything. And we need to do this because the Lord is coming and he wants to find us unified in the service of each other. 
Jesus started to preach that gospel very emphatically when someone dared to talk about glory. The mother of James, I can't even believe this time. Let's just not think about it. The mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. What a seer the woman was. She knew that glory was imminent. And she came to Jesus. She says, when you get to your kingdom, other people were still doubting if he was a king. But this lady had already seen the kingdom. She said, when you get to your kingdom, will you allow for my sons, the two of them, not all these other rascals, just these two, let them sit one at your right hand and the other at your left. <laughs> what is interesting is this, when you think about it in reality, those two names represent the, the elevation to the throne of God. John means the grace of God. James is, a, is, 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 um, is derived from Jacob, which means to reap where you have not sown. Jacob means the supplanter. So he was not the one who planted, but he was the one who comes to harvest. And that is how we are. We are Jacob because we were not the ones who planted this eternal life. We have already lost the life that we were given. And now Jesus planted life, his life, and then we have reaped that life. And that is eternal life. And that's why Jacob, I mean, he, he, what's the other guy's name? David prophesied. He says, I am Jacob, the generation of those who seek the Lord. I will not be consumed. What he was saying by using the expression, I will not be consumed. It means my life will not be terminated. So as Jacob, I'm going to have eternal life. And so the woman, what she was saying, she was speaking prophetically. She may not even have known it. I'd never even thought about it. But it just hit me that James and John, to be on either side of the Lord Jesus, is actually the picture of our salvation because it is the grace of God and that divine enablement by faith is what allows for us to reap where we have not sown eternal life. She said, if you would allow them to sit one at your left and the other at your right, you would have done well. And Jesus looked at her and then looked at the others. In case anyone is getting ideas, Jesus said to them, that's not how. Whoever must be the greatest amongst you must learn to be the servant of all. We're going to read one scripture from Nehemiah, break bread, and I'm going to explain this for two more minutes. But let's just quickly go to Nehemiah. After the book of Ezra, just before the book of Job. Or Nehemiah, just before the book of Ezra, I mean. So, we're going to read Jeremiah, I mean, Nehemiah uh, chapter 11, verse 1. And it says, um, Now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem, the rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city. And the nine-tenths were to do well in other cities. This was how preferential treatment was given in the past. They would cast lots. And then one part out of ten would go into the city. The others, they find their level. Right? That was how you became an elite back in the day among the people of God. That was how you became someone important. It was left to chance. But in the New Testament, it is no longer meant to be left to chance in the New Testament. Guess what it is left to? It is left to you and I to choose the ones that receive preferential treatment. The Apostle Paul says, prefer one another. One another. Let the others come before you. Because those who do so are essentially creating for themselves a place right next to the Lord Jesus. He says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water to drink. You gave me that which was yours because you made me, you, you, in your heart, you concluded that I was worthy of honor. And not only did you conclude that I was worthy of honor, you gave to me something that you cannot take back. You gave to me food that you cannot take back. You gave to me water that you cannot take back. You truly gave. And that is how I became an elite because you treated me with dignity. And Jesus says, because of that, you have a place in the new Jerusalem. My place in the new Jerusalem 
in God's city of eternal peace. He's not going to be left to chance. He's not going to be by the function of some elders. Some people somewhere casting lots to say, now I am an ordained minister. And because of that, everybody has to respect me. No, that is not what it should be left to. It should be left in the hands of each and every one of us to treat others with utmost dignity, kindness, patience, and love. Because by so doing, we are becoming Paul, Timothy, and Philemon. The little ones who have learned the art of honor and who do it so graciously by kissing one another's feet. Once we have done that, we will never be robbed of our peace. Once we have done that, we will never panic about any situation because every time we do that to another, we are securing our place at the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ and on his left. And when you do that, guess what that means? It means you will always be at peace because the Bible says he who sits in the heavens laughs because nothing can trouble you while you're seated at the right hand of the Father. Nothing can come to you there because everyone who sits at the right, of the right hand of the Father, the Father has made a commitment to. He said, I will fight your battle until I make all your enemies your footstool. Anybody here wants that kind of peace? Praise the Lord. Serve others. And in that same vein, the Bible says the Lord Jesus took, his, took the bread. And he blessed it. And he said, this is my body. He broke it and he says, this is my body broken for you. He took the cup and he did the same. He says, this is my blood. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you for your working in us, your unction that allows for us to function as the gifts that we are to the body of Christ, in the prophetic, in the teaching, in the apostolic, in every area that you have called us to. Father, we thank you. And now as we partake of the Lord's body and drink of his blood in remembrance of him, let our eyes be open. So we're going to do things a little differently today. We're going to break bread with two scriptures, praise the Lord. And just give, us, give ourselves some time to digest the bread. Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. And we're going to read verse 7 as well. So verse 1 is for the body, verse 7 is for the blood. So if you, want to, if you can open with one hand as I'm doing, please go ahead. Otherwise, listen and I will read it. The Bible says in verse 1, that now the whole earth had one language and one speech. The whole world was one body in the beginning. But when Jesus came, the Bible says he broke his body. Because what he was doing was he was reversing the division. Because the whole world was one and then it was broken. And Jesus prayed, he says, Father, make them one as we are one. So when you go from whole to broken, you have to go from broken to whole. He broke his body so that we can be one in him. And so as we break bread today, I pray that each and every one of us will begin to see others who are heirs of salvation together with Christ Jesus as one with us. Because if my brother is one with me, if my sister is one with me, then there will be no honor that is too much to give to them because they are one with the Lord. Whatever it is that is worthy of a royalty, of royalty, of kings and priests is what I need to give to everybody. And it will be easier for me when I know that we are one. And so as we partake of the Lord's body today, once again, we will be in Christ Jesus. We will be of one body, of one mind, understanding each other as we dwell together in one accord, awaiting once again the mighty wind of heaven Awaiting once again the Pentecost. You may eat of the Lord's body. Praise the Lord. Verse 7 says, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. When Jesus was on the cross, his only mission 
was for his life to go down, for his blood to be shed, and that blood was his life, for the life of an animal is in his blood. And on that cross, it was that animal of sacrifice. It was that lamb of sacrifice. And his blood went down so that in every area wherein our lives have been set into confusion, this other going down will lift us up with a sound mind. And that is the reason why it is said that we have not received the spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. As I partake of the blood of Jesus today, in remembrance of him, as I consume and take into, my li into myself again, is life, I will not find it too tedious to be at peace with my brothers and sisters. It will not be difficult for me to be one with them because any confusion that went into the world that causes us not to understand one another has been remedi remediated in, the, in Christ Jesus by the blood of the Lamb. So as we partake of the blood today, we partake of the one life that binds us together. We partake of the one love that binds us together. And that same love that was shed abroad our hearts by the Holy Spirit constrains us to love one another as we have been loved of God. So we take in the blood of Jesus in remembrance of him. We receive and magnify the life of the Son of God, a life that is able to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. His blood and his life went down that we may be raised victorious and united in him. Drink of his blood in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I am delighted because the Lord is uniting us as he prepares us once again for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I can tell you one thing that is going to happen very evidently. By the time we get to be in that one place that we are going to, the Bible says that we're in one place and they were in one accord. Our days may be numbered in this place, but a few weeks before we have to find another place. But then I tell you what, in the next place that we are going to, it is already revealed and it will be experienced. We will receive a mighty visitation of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. On Saturday, some people were trying to get the words out of me, but I refused to speak. But now I speak to you. They asked me, they said, man of God, what is that Wednesday meeting that you speak of? That Wednesday meeting is our first midweek meeting in the place that we are going to. And that meeting marks the beginning of visitations like we have only prayed for and only imagined. It's going to be amazing. So that is why the Lord is bringing this word now about learning to honor one another, about learning to stay in one accord, about understanding what it means to speak in the language of love and the language of the heart of God so that we can truly or so that it can be said by the heralding angels that they are now ready because they are in one place and in one accord. You see, because the Holy Spirit isn't just going to come down until he receives the feedback from the heralding angels. Remember Daniel chapter 12, Michael waited until the angel sounded the trumpet and then he came down. Let the angels who are watching over our gathering be able to say they are in one accord. God bless you. I'll see you on Saturday, God willing. Alan. All righty, let's celebrate what the Lord has done tonight. How many are excited? Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Thank God for my wife. You know, I told you that women, their ministry is like the ministry of the Holy Spirit. They bring to your remembrance. So can we all just be seated? On Saturday, we were going to take a testimony, and I said, we're going to take it today. Let me tell you something. This is a testimony that I know will help some of us who have hailing family members that we have been believing for healing for. All right, my sister Miriam, I think she's going to go get Kayla, right? Oh, yeah, that is good. So I'm just going to wait until she comes. I've been wanting to read a scripture, but I was feeling like I ran out of time. So while Kayla is coming, I'm just going to read that scripture to you very quickly. So come with me to Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 19. Revelation chapter 12, we'll start with 7 if she doesn't get here quick enough. 
Then we read, we read, um, uh, we read uh, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 and 9. So look at what it says. The Bible says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. On Saturday, I was telling you that many people get discouraged because they think they have to fight the next battle that is coming. And the Lord is saying, no, you don't have to fight. You just have to rise up and the battle is the Lord's. So the Lord would have me remind you that when the dragon and his army present themselves, they've been assembling themselves very desperately since end of 2021. When, when it started, the Lord revealed it to me and I shared it with you. I even saw it in the physical summer of 2022 at London Heathrow. I saw the movement of people and the Lord said to me, remember what I told you about the army that is being assembled. They are assembling themselves and they're not just spirit looking beings anymore. Many of them have taken the form of men and they're among us. But I want you to be confident. You see, because some of us, unbeknownst to us, we pass by them, your heart feels uncomfortable. Something turns within you because you have just passed by a woman or a man, but the reality of it is you're passing by wickedness embodied in flesh of clay. But I tell you what, do not be afraid. Speak to your heart. It is well with me. Michael and his angels, we do battle. But for you not to be caught in fire, you need to be at peace. Remember what the Lord told us as soon as he said that Satan was assembling his army. He says, do not be found on the streets. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go grocery shopping. It just means those people who are on the street are the people who are not at peace. They're pacing back and forth. But when you're in your home, mentally, in your heart, in your thoughts, you're at peace. You're not going to be roaming. So if you don't want to be caught in the war of the angels, be at peace. To be at peace is to be Paul, Timothy, and Philemon. So ladies and gentlemen, as we used to say, with Jesus' joy, I want to welcome Chris and Kayla Whitehead to share their testimony. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's celebrate these guys. Don't worry, I guarantee you, we're going, to be, we're going to be out of here before midnight. So that is still good. So it's still a Tuesday meeting. We started late anyway. I mean, so my wife says not to worry about it. So no, no, not to worry about it. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's keep celebrating them, folks. Come on now. Praise God. Oh, you got your mics already. Communion House family, I come to you today, or we come to you today, with the greatest testimony. Um, I think uh, a lot of the women who are on the prayer call on Saturday have probably gotten a sneak peek at this testimony. Um, is, this, is that better? That's better. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm naturally loud, so I don't know why it wasn't resonating. But anyway, um, y'all probably got a peek at this particular testimony, but just wanted to share it with the church as a whole. And um, our Heavenly Father is just so faithful. He's just so faithful. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, our son Elijah was dealing with some fevers, and they were, they were going on for like 10, 12 days. And so we were really worried. Here he comes now. We were really worried. Oh, we, <laughs> come on up, man. Come on up. Come on up, baby girl. It's a family affair. The whole, the whole crew. Whitehead party of four. Hey. So, so God is so good. You know, he was, he was going through. Yeah, come on, come on up, baby. Come on. Yeah. He was going through. He was going through. Hey, hello. Don't put your mouth on and say hello. Hello. Say God is good. <laughs> so, I said that to say, uh, we ended up, hold on, we ended up taking him to the hospital, um, or I took him to the hospital on one of my days during the week, and they told me, they're like, yeah, it's, it's, it's just something viral, don't worry about it, you know, give it some time, and so after two days, same thing's going on, I'm like the doctor in the house, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to take him to the pediatrician and see what they say. Pediatrician's like, oh, it's just something viral. They did some blood tests. Everything came back cool. Fever's still going on. This is going on three weeks at this point, right? And so we're praying. We're doing all of the things, okay? And the day, it was Wednesday. No, it was Tuesday uh, night or Tuesday afternoon. And my parents were keeping them. And my parents go, or my dad goes, y'all will meet him soon. 
He goes, y'all better figure this out because I'm taking him up to the hospital. We're going to figure out what's going on. And so I said a prayer at that moment. I'll never forget. I was in my car. I said, God, I said, you know, what, you know what's going on. This is, this is your child first. You know, we are just the custodians here. We are his earthly parents. So I had to remind myself of that. And so at that very instant, I, gave, I just gave it to him. And lo and behold, that night, Kayla woke up at 3.30 in the morning and told me she heard a voice that said, take him to the hospital. They're going to tell you everything that's wrong, and he will be well. And so we listened to, listened to that instruction and did what we were told. Uh, got to the hospital. They saw what was going on. Immediately got on the medication. Talked to Pastor Moses. Talked to Brother Allen. And, and out of prayer and just God just working and just being so faithful. You see him now. He's back healthy, everything is great, God is good. So, yes, man. So, I've been, I've been kind of, you know, bugging Pastor Moses about, man, I wanna share this, I wanna share this. So I'm just so thankful that, um, you know, Sister Rosemary reminded you, uh, cause I wasn't gonna, I was gonna be like, all right, I guess I'll wait till Saturday. So that God is so good. We just wanted to share that with you and tell y'all we appreciate all the prayers. I know we weren't really good at communicating putting it all in the chat and everything, but uh, we were just so caught up in everything and just, you know, just pressing in that we didn't really have time to do that, but we just wanted to share that and say we're thankful, and God is good. God is good, y'all. Yes, God is good. God is good. Yes, 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 yes. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate again what the Lord has done. I don't know about y'all, but it's time to be turned up by these testimonies that have been coming forth because we've been pressing in so much to see the move of God, and he's moving mightily. So we have to give honor. We have to give glory where it is due of what the Lord has done concerning our children, concerning our youth, concerning the petitions that we have placed before him. I don't know about you, but I'm loving on my daddy right now for what he has done. See, this is a season where you have to press through and you're seeing it come to pass. Y'all gotta act like you know. You gotta act like you know, hallelujah. God is good. Let's give him faith tonight. We have the giving details on the screen. You'll see to our family online several ways to give. God, come on somebody. God is good. How many are excited as we prepare for our offering about the meeting that has been declared over us, that Wednesday meeting? This is a visitation. How many remember maybe, uh, uh, maybe uh, a year or two ago, it seems so long ago now, there was a season while we were still in the basement where the woman of God declared over us that we were having a visitor. You see, and so the Lord has been announcing these meetings, and every time he announces the meeting, we experience such movement of God. A lot of us begin to be activated in the dream life again. We begin seeing a lot, so I really want us again to assess the timeline uh, that the Lord had us on when he's declaring a meeting for us to be prepared to go to the next level. God is good with our offerings prepared. Let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we say that there's none like you. For indeed, you give seed to the soul of Father. We give you praise on tonight for you have showed your mercy. Lord, for your word declares that we overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb, by our testimonies, O oh God, not loving our lives unto death. O oh God, and you work this thing through us. Lord, you have made us your righteousness. There is none like you. Let these offerings, as we have prepared them, O oh God, as we give by your instruction in obedience unto you, be found pleasing in your sight. We declare that all glory and honor belong to you. And we all said, amen. Hallelujah. Let's celebrate the Lord again. God is so good. Come on, come on. Don't forget... We are going to continue and pressing in in prayer tomorrow, 9 p.m. Nothing changed. We're on Instagram. And one thing I want to help us with is that the man of God declared over us that we'll begin to see ourselves as the Lord has made us. And one thing that I have been seeing of myself is, man of God, clear skin, skin that is just so pure. 
you see, and so the Lord is working in us that wholeness. That's what I've been pulling from that skin that I've been seeing, that wholeness that begins from deep down. So let's be encouraged to press into prayer to see what the Lord has in store for us. Everyone have a blessed night.